All right, everybody, uh, it's uh, two o'clock uh, on a uh, fantastically sunny slash overcast slash cloudy slash I don't know what it looks like outside. I haven't been outside all day. Um, but we've got uh, Kim Ludbrook with us today um, for his uh, Prezo. I am super excited at uh, you know, the opportunity for, for him to come and uh, chat to us and show his work. Um, I've been a, a fanboy of his for, for many years. Um, you know, when, uh, when he did a, a presentation for Canon Roadshow and uh, uh, you told us about how we, he was sitting on uh, uh, the, the motorbikes, uh, the press motorbikes at Tour de France. I kind of went, ooh, that, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I reckon that, um, you know, if uh, in a previous life or early in life, if I take gone left instead of right, I might have been, um, you know, exactly where, where he is today. Um, hopefully as, as accomplished as he is, but, uh, but certainly I would just love to, uh, you know, to, to get a, a, an eye in what, uh, what he's seeing there. So, um, yeah, I think let's, um, let's uh, kick off. Kim, over to you, buddy. I'm, I'm looking forward to these awesome shots. Quentin, thanks, man. And uh, to everyone out there who I can't see, <laughs> technically, I um, hope you can hear me well and hope you're safe at home and uh, staying off the streets. Um, quite a crazy time to be talking to you about what I do. Um, and Quentin, yeah, I don't know, maybe you should have just stayed right or left or wherever you wanted to go because, um, you know, as much as there's quite a romantic uh, notion about being a news agency photographer, it really isn't that romantic. I think probably 5% of what I do and my colleagues in the news agencies is pretty romantic. The rest is flipping hard work, um, long hours, pretty taxing but um yeah i mean uh, to use a little cliche it's a champagne lifestyle on a beer salary so um <laughs> yeah i'll uh, i'll just keep waffling on for a while um anyway so yeah i mean my name's kim i'm talking to you from westin in johannesburg um i'm uh, 50 years old and i've been shooting for probably 25 years um started my career down in the cape on the newspapers there and then um late 90s moved to Joburg. um worked at the legendary star newspaper photo desk there for five years and joined this news agency i'm with now um gee i can't believe it anyway 17 years ago so i worked for an international news agency um uh, we are based, our head office is in Frankfurt in Germany, but we have about 200 staff photographers around the world, of which I'm one of them. And the interesting thing that I wanted to sort of talk to you about today is um, sort of the massive cross-section and wide variety of work that, that we do. Um, you know, photojournalism in its broader context in, includes news photography, uh, it includes sports, it includes features. Um, so as a news agency photographer, I pretty much do it all, um, which is something I really love just because, um, you know, it suits my personality. I couldn't, as much as I love sport, for instance, I really don't see myself doing sport permanently. So um, conversely, I wouldn't really want to be out there doing hard news all the time. So that sort of balance of, um, well, before Corona <laughs> came along, um, shooting you know, sports on weekends, um, news throughout the week, and features, I really enjoy that aspect of my job. Um, so, you know, and I think that slide you're seeing right now is just a little indication of, of, of what I love about the job. You know, as a, as a lighty, I was born in Zimbabwe as a young man. I was brought up uh, by my father who was a game ranger. I used to sort of walk in the bush on my own and, um, um, middle teens I got my first camera and uh, used to just explore the world around me with a camera and I suppose I'm doing exactly the same thing now all these decades later and um, at the moment sort of effectively going onto the streets in Joburg covering corona I'm doing effectively the same thing I'm basically using a camera to explore the world and at the moment explore a very strange and almost bizarre world out of out of this house so you know that's still what I do um, so news coverage wise, yeah, I mean, I've, you know, uh, in the last 17 years, I've covered um, the first, uh, sorry, second Gulf War. This is a picture from Iraq. Um, I was embedded there with the US military. Um, this was actually the same week that Saddam was caught. So, you know, one of our roles as photojournalists is to cover major news, in, news events. And as an agency, we um, rotate staff on these big news events. Um, 
which I'll, I'll come back to shortly about the difference between all of these big stories I've done in the coronavirus. I mean, effectively, there is no rotating at the moment for us. I mean, we all, in our home bases around the world, and almost every photographer at EPA is producing corona pictures. So back to um, this next image. Um, this was the civil war in Libya. Um, I've covered two civil wars now, the war in, um, in, in Libya, which was, of course, the downfall of Saddam Hussein, and then the downfall of... Um, in, in Liberia, uh, 2003, Charles Taylor. Um, uh, this is a picture from that civil war. Um, also covered a lot of um, elections throughout Africa, which invariably and unfortunately sometimes end in violence and um, you know political disputes. So that's also another big part of our job as news agency photographers. Um, this is a picture from the Asian tsunami and. Um, you know, again, I just keep referring to Corona, which I'll talk about later. Um, this, this I thought was probably the biggest story I've covered in terms of magnitude. Um, you know, I went to Sri Lanka about a week after the tsunami had struck and covered the sort of aftermath of that. So, um, yeah, this Corona story has totally shifted my perception. I never really thought I'd cover a pandemic in my life. Absolutely. Um, also, yeah. Um, and uh, this is um, Barack Obama's first inauguration, so I was blessed to get over to Washington for that. Um, and then locally, yeah, I mean, obviously, part and parcel of what we do as photojournalists is we, I, I, I say that we are a mirror to the world. So, of course, our, our mirror that we're showing viewers at the moment is generally the, the pandemic, the coronavirus. But here in South Africa, I've lived through, I mean, I just started my career as just after the end of apartheid, so I missed that era. But um, you know, I've covered everything from the xenophobia outbreaks. Um, you know, I don't know. I cannot remember how many protests. Um, and so that that's obviously a large part of what we do as as, as agency photographers is cover the news. Um, this picture here is um, of Mandela's funeral. Um, that on its own you know, one could talk about for hours. It was just such a overwhelming story to cover. So, yeah, I think that's a little idea of what I do on, on the news front. And then sports as well. I mean, if you, I like to put it in this context, news agencies um, are being used more and more by newspapers to show sporting events and cover sport because newspapers have much smaller budgets now. And in general, they don't have the budgets to send their own photographers to cover a lot of big sports. So um, in the sporting realm, I've been blessed to um, cover four Tour de France. And it's continued. Yeah. <laughs> very, very that jealous. Was, um, yeah, that was really radical. I mean, I'm a very amateur cyclist and, and I ride a motorbike. So it was like three things that I really love in life put all into one. Um, absolutely radical assignment. Um, you know, the figures are, are speak for themselves. I think in the car, we, we travel six and a half to 7,000 kilometers in one Tour de France, just following the race. Um, it's between 15 and 20 hotels in 25 days. So you almost move every single day. And um, yeah, it's just this almost overwhelming, um, it's not even a sporting event. I think it's more than that. It's, it's obviously a national, treasure in France and actually um, I've been waiting with bated breath to see if they're actually going to run the Tour de France this year. I mean, I'm not covering it, but just as a sporting event, I think that's one of the next big ones that they could get cancelled. Um, yeah, I've covered uh, Rugby World Cup in New Zealand. Um, I've done two Soccer World Cups, so uh, the one in Germany and then of course our amazing one 2010 in South Africa. Lots and lots of local rugby, super rugby, um, you know, test matches, which, yeah, I mean, as we all know, have been totally postponed indefinitely. So it's quite radical at the moment that I'm just shooting no sport. There's, there's nothing to do. Um, also, I do a lot of stuff like this, which is, you know, bodybuilding competition. So, you know, quite a lot of uh, smaller, almost regional sporting events. Um, yeah, my other favorite is the Cape Epic. Um, I think I've covered six now. 
And um, a little funny anecdote about the coronavirus and the epic. I, w I actually was lying in my hotel room now, two and a half weeks ago, ready to cover the race in Cape Town. And um, that's when the press release went out from the epic that they were canceling. And uh, that's sort of, you know, where my whole life changed. I had to change my flight. That took two days to do and get back to Joburg and sort of been on the corona story since then. So, yeah, I'm pretty miffed that we're not covering an epic this year. That's also on the back of a motorbike. So it's, yeah, it's something that I really like to shoot. I suppose the only thing um, that you have to deal with uh, on the epic is uh, an epic amount of dust if you... <laughs> If you're on the <laughs> roads and, and things like that, it's not like Tour de France where it's nice and clean and, uh, you know, you don't come back with a face full of whatever, except you've, if you're on cobbles. But uh, 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 Epic is a completely different story. Yeah, I mean, it's such a, it's such a strange assignment because, you know, you, 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 so technically we, we live in a little media village, which is part of the race. We live in tents. So, like it's it's this really cool assignment to do where you 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 know you're out on the motorbike most of the day and then um, you eat with the riders. Um, the the epic put on really amazing media facilities for us in each of the villages, and then yeah you sleep in a tent and wake up the next morning half broken because you haven't hardly slept in the tent, and then you know back on the motorbike and and um, in this case the epic actually um, spends. I think it's probably eighty to hundred thousand rand hiring um, about ten motor, motorbikes and riders to to take media on the course. So um, yeah, it's a super unique sporting event to cover. You know, you're basically um, living in a tent for seven nights and covering this the sporting event that um, doesn't have a stadium. I mean, I think that's the one thing I like to to talk about when it comes to cycling i mean most sporting events that we cover have a stadium they have one set place it may be like this picture you're looking at now this is world superbikes at kailami i mean there's a racetrack but cycling is very different especially stage racing because like the tour de france i mean uh, the stadium is actually three and a half thousand kilometers of open road in france um, so yeah, the, the, the epic and, and cycling in general, I really love covering it because it's just absolutely so unique. Um, and yeah, so just changed to another picture. Um, this is some diving from um, the FINA World Diving Champs um, in, in, in China, which I covered. And one of my favorite like sporting pictures, I don't know how good the quality is for the viewers, but this is a cool anecdote. I shot the Olympics in Athens, 2004. And, um, you know, I actually, I'd never done major athletics. So my editors wouldn't put me on that, which is totally understandable. That's mega pressure on sort of shooting the 100 meter men's final. So they put me on all these little sports. You know, I think I did probably 10 different sports, archery, sailing, volleyball, boxing. And anyway, this little, this picture, actually one of my best tear sheets ever. It ran this huge double page in Stern magazine in, in, in Germany. And shame, man, this dude was just about to start his heat and he took a leak. <laughs> and I, I couldn't help taking the moment. But if you, if you, if you know anything about um, sort of countries, you'll see IRL means island. And I saw his, I see his name on the, on the sail as Fitzpatrick. So shame, man. <laughs> um, but so the next slide just, I think, sort of describes what a, what a photo, photojournalist, our main role basically is, is to photograph the human condition. So, you know, what do I mean by that? Well, um, as human beings, we have the most incredible expression of what we do um, and, and, and covering everything from sport to news to festivals and features, we, we end up covering almost every facet of, of this condition, which is the human condition. And I think, you know, this is more features work now that I'm going to show you. Um, for instance, this picture is really one of my most memorable assignments was in Madagascar. Um, I went there and did three or four features in one trip in one week. But I documented this um, ritual that happens every year of, it's called Fama Diana, which basically is the local tribes people in the south of the island dig up the dead, exhume the dead, and then um honor their, their relatives and re, and and rebury them and um yeah that was just totally fascinating to see 
actually it wasn't macabre in any way. I mean, I really enjoyed it. They really connected with their ancestors. But um, the problem there was that for me to get access, um, the family said I must sit and have a drink with them. <laughs> hmm. And it was like this moonshine, hard tack alcohol. And basically, I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. I was absolutely hammered for the whole day <laughs> because like I, I had no option. I mean, I sat in there very, like the sort of mud hut, very poor community with the fixer, the guy who had helped me get there. And I really couldn't say no to them. So yeah, I was pretty much, um, you know, uh, really drunk for the whole day <laughs> covering that assignment. That's crazy. Um, <laughs> yeah, this this story is part of Kim. Um, just a I'm, just a question I'm, here. Sure. Um, as a as a, it's from Roland Harris. Uh, as a photojournalist, how do you handle situations, i.e., rioting that turns violent? Um, how do you cope emotionally or distance yourself when you may want to get involved on a personal level and help others? I mean, for example, um, the uh, being a Kevin Carter photo of the starving girl and vulture in South Sudan. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks for the question. Um, in short, it's always difficult. <laughs> um, I think I'm in a much better space now at my age to, to, to work those boundaries out. That I think when I was younger, I didn't really have that ability. And, you know, I'll be totally honest with you. I mean, uh, I used to try and um, solve lots of my issues with what I'd shot by drinking too much when I was younger. And I soon realized that you can't really, you know, find an answer for for this at the bottom of a bottle. So, you know, I've turned to sort of a much healthier lifestyle, which really does help me just deal with the pressure and the stress. Um, I, I think part of that question, how do you deal with the safety part, is really important. Um, we at at the agencies, we um, we 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 get sent on hostile environments courses. So these are courses run by, um, in general, ex-Special Forces soldiers who teach us, um, uh, you know, safety measures that we can implement when we're in the field. Um, I won't elaborate too much, but it's basically um, giving us real good knowledge on, on how to act and how to behave and how to protect ourselves in these sort of environments. So that, I think that's really critical and helped me a lot. Um, but still, the mental part of it, um, I'll be quite honest, I don't think media organizations, and this, I must hasten to add, doesn't include EPA, who I work for, but I don't think the mental health of, of, of journalists in general is something that's um, given enough attention. And already on the corona story, um, we're talking amongst ourselves as journalists, and in general, we're not really getting the support from the media houses um, that, that we need. So it's, it's, it's a two-way street. I think that media houses really need to take our safety absolutely first. And I also think as journalists, we need to push this agenda. Um, on to like Kevin Carter's famous, infamous um, picture and the debate that always surrounds that. And it's, it's an obvious one and it's a good one. Um, it's down to the individual photographer and in my case, me to make those decisions on how, how and when or if I can get involved in the scenario in front of me. Um, um, the one thing to add that is most important is that we are observers. So yes, there are times where I have physically helped someone and that, at that moment I stopped being a photojournalist and I became a human being. Um, and, and, and that boundary and that scenario is very difficult to judge when you're in the field. Um, so, yeah, I don't want to elaborate too much, but I hope that that answers that question. Yeah, that's great. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, we were just talking a little bit about the human condition. So um, I think I'm falling a bit behind with slides. Don't worry. Um, yeah. So, you know, the human condition is basically what we photograph. It's everything from weddings to funerals to the, the most brutally sad moments to the most uplifting moments. Um, I think, okay, this is a picture of, of the South African elections. Um, but I, and I often find in, in sporting events is where you find those radical um, shifts between, you know, the absolute elation of winning a World Cup and, for instance, or that mega depression of not winning one so i suppose the sports fans you'll know that whatever team you support 
um, there, there, there's that radical shift between the, the, you know, the elation and the sadness is quite often what, what we end up photographing, which, which is obvious. Um, you know, one thing I do love doing is shooting festivals. Um, this is from Stonehenge in the UK two years ago now, um, summer solstice. Um, but I just, I love festivals myself. So it's, it's quite a large part of, of what I cover. I make, make sure for EPA that I, I cover as many festivals as I can each year. Because I just love that, that human interaction that, that we end up photographing. It's an awesome, um, uh, awesome picture there, I must say. This one's even better. There. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is like a, um, you know, there's, there's one thing that you do as a photojournalist. You make, you make contacts with people um, through all walks of life and you maintain them and then you keep going back to those places. Like this, for instance, is a picture in Alex Township um, in Johannesburg. There's a trampoline club, which, which a guy set up just for the kids to play after school. And I mean, I must have been back there maybe five, six, seven times. And so that's another very important part of what, what you should do as a photojournalist is just have this, this little black book of contacts um, that you can go back to all the time to revisit. Um, and that's, that's an example um, of that. Um, so yeah, um, when I studied, I studied photojournalism in the UK and um, there we, we specialized in a way, it was a three of course, but we specialized in storytelling. So as a photojournalist, you're still telling a story with a single picture, that's your job. But what I like doing is a bit of a more in-depth um, photo essay, um, which is, you know, an untold number of pictures, but it's, it's, a, it's a longer story that you, you tell about, in this case, um, this amazing sort of uh, very amateur hardcore wrestling uh, fraternity in, in, on the East Rand that I've been going back to again a couple of years now, I think maybe two and a half years. And so this is the thing that I really love the most actually out of what I do is, uh, you know, that camera being your passport, it sounds like such a cliche, but it really is, you know, I, I, I'm amazed that the things that I've seen and photographed in my life that I would never have seen if I didn't have a camera. And in this case, um, I never would have thought I would document um, these flippin' hardcore wrestlers um, if I didn't have a camera. So here's a little, a couple of pictures um, on what I, I sort of do as a classic black and white photo essay. So it's really documenting people's lives. It's about spending time with them Here's a picture, for instance, of these amateurs training. I, I would go there on a Tuesday and a Thursday to document them training, and then on a weekend when they fight. So, oh, how's that? Um, <laughs> that wasn't nice. This was at a... Um, That's going to leave bike. a mark for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this, this is what I really enjoy doing. This is when I'm at my, my real happy space, is just sort of me, a camera, and people that I don't know, or an environment I don't know. And yeah, let's hit each other over the head with a pane of glass. Um, so, and, I, and I think that sort of stems back to my real childhood when I just explored uh, you know, around me when I was a teenager with a camera. That still is what, is what drives me a lot. Um, and this is, in a way, um, just as some background to some of you may not know, um, sort of the core essence of photojournalism as we know today started um, in the 30s in the Great Depression in the US and then into the 40s, Second World War, 50s and 60s with, in Vietnam. Um, this is when this sort of style of photography or black and white photo essay um, documenting people's lives, it became something that um, Life magazine did in the US, and that sort of started this um, way of shooting that we still do today. Um, so I'm just going to sort of go through these pictures a bit quicker. Um, so you know, this is this is what I love: getting into people's lives and uh, and and documenting it with a camera. And then obviously you've got to finish your Rostoy day with a cold beer. <laughs> After action satisfaction. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're doing quite well. I'm quite ahead. Um, 
what I wanted to do now, though, just, you know, there's a, there's a um, sort of brief about what I, what I shoot as a news agency photographer. Maybe before I start talking about the corona side of things, um, just a little bit of technical stuff. Um, we, you know, we, we're obviously shooting on digital cameras. Um, the agency moves about 1,000 to 1,500 pictures a day to our clients. So um, we, we send all of our pictures to Frankfurt from wherever we are in the world. And there they're edited by editors um, who obviously check the captions. They do their own post-production on the pictures. And then those pictures are sent with a satellite feed to all of our clients around the world. And here in South Africa, the whole of the independent newspaper group, so that's the star uh, Cape Times, Pretoria News, so on and so forth. They, one of our clients, the Citizen is, um, ENCA, Daily Maverick, um, and so on and so forth. So, you know, I'm just trying to describe a world that's very immediate. Um, on sporting events, we, you know, for instance, a World Cup soccer match, you know, you, you, you're basically sending pictures live from your, from your laptop. Um, the laptop's plugged into a LAN cable. Um, the pictures are transmitted immediately. Um, on the Tour de France, for instance, um, we were transmitting the pictures from the back of the mo motorbike. Um, we just have a little Wi-Fi dongle um, 4G. Thank God France has got pretty good 4G. And uh, so I would keep transmitting from the motorbike uh, throughout the day. So it's very much a, a, an immediate world. Um, I actually did a little test once. I think I shot a picture um, on the Tour de France and, and, and timed it from when it left the motorbike to when it got to the Star newspaper in Johannesburg. And that was four minutes. So it's wow. really, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very immediate world. Um, what scares me a little bit is that it's becoming more immediate. And, you know, I predict as I see camera technology um, sort of improving in terms of transmission. Um, so what I mean by that is sending images with Wi-Fi from the camera to an end point. Um, you know, I can probably see a world in the not too distant future where um, an editor may even strangely look through my viewfinder from Germany. And push the shutter. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, I mean, tell me what to shoot. Or, I mean, that sort of convergence of, of technology is not far away. Um, so, yeah, it's just, I think, interesting that that's the one aspect of being a, a news agency and a newspaper. I mean, newspaper, my friends on the Star and local newspaper guys are, are in the same boat. It's very much an immediate um, world. Um, nothing set up. It's, uh, it's recording the moment and, and within reason getting that picture out as soon as possible. So I uh, just thought I'd elaborate on that. Just a quick one, uh, Kim. Um, so when, when you're on the back of the bikes, you, are you um, sending it through, uh, through a laptop? No, no. So, um, you know, all of the major manufacturers, in my case, I use Canon. Um, there's a, there's a Wi-Fi transmitter that you put on the side of the camera. Then we basically... Um, in the camera settings, we, we set up, a, in Frankfurt, we'll set up a FTP folder, and then we'll set that into the camera. So what I'll do is I'll shoot, I won't transmit every picture, but I'll, I'll, I'll transmit the picture that is worth transmitting, that is good enough to go onto the news right. agency. And that gets sent from the camera with a little Wi-Fi transmitter to the Wi-Fi dongle, which is on me, and it's using, a, the 4G network in France, and then that is being FTP basically as we're moving down the road to Frankfurt. And then there's an editor sitting there who's receiving my pictures live, basically. And then he will he has to um, sort of caption the picture and work out who the cyclist is, um, and 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 or and or what's happened in that crash or in that moment. Um, so that's sort of how we move move the picture live on on the Twitter front. One of the guys yesterday, I think it was yesterday, um, from Canon was saying that, um, uh, I, I think I'm, I'm probably going to get this wrong, but it, I think it's a WFTP or a WTP yes, or something correct. like that. 18 yeah. seconds to get it from camera to, uh, to editor. 
Yeah, I mean, that's, that's you know, absolutely. That's I mean, and now, I mean, as I say, look, I mean, I, I represent Canon, but it's not really a Canon talk. This is for all of us who use whatever cameras you use. It doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. But I mean, what's, what's happening now is that in some of the uh, Canon models and across the board, I mean, I just love the fact that, you know, they've got built-in Wi-Fi now. You know, it's, you, can, you can share your stuff directly to social media or to, to your laptop, or in our case, it's FTP across the world. I mean, it's radical. Yeah. It's really radical technology. I mean, when I started, I started in an era with film. I don't know if you guys know what that is. Um, that uh, stuff that comes yeah, in a little uh, roll. No, no. Yeah. No, that's, a, that's <laughs> no, what? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not being facetious. It's just, yeah, I mean, I started in, a, in, a, in, in, you know, in the um, 80s and then um, sort of 93, I got my first job in the Cape. And I mean, we shot film, so the mm. life was completely different. Um, you know, 36 images on a roll. I mean, you really took your time. You, you composed your image. You took time. You shot two or three images. Um, it was it was a whole different way of seeing and shooting, um, you know. Then it was obviously on assignment. I'd have to take chemicals with me. Um, really strange shit used to happen in hotel rooms <laughs> around the world because I mean we would turn the hotel room into a dark room. I mean I literally would travel. I remember my first foreign assignment was to Zimbabwe um, for Associated Press, a different news agency, and I mean I took all the chemicals I needed to develop the film. Um, I think it was an LS2000 scanner, neck scanner. Um, and I turned that hotel room right into a dark room. <laughs> so, <laughs> Crazy. Uh, you know, yeah, and it, but, but what I miss about that was that, you know, I, and I only talk about what we do as, as, as photojournalists. It was a lot, it was very deliberate. And because film cost money and it was, it was more difficult to shoot images and then have to process them, you really took your time, you know, you um, not only sort of framing the, the image and shooting it, but, um, you took your time editing and, and you know, on an assignment, um, if I sent 10 pictures in a day from some, a story like that, that was, a, that was a good edit, you know, I mean, you know, you, that, that you had done well, that was a good production. Um, I mean, now on a, with digital cameras on a big news day, you know, it's 25, 30, 40 pictures. And, mm -hmm. and I, I, in, in ways, I don't agree with that. Um, I, I'm trying to stay in that sort of mindset that I started with um, two, three decades ago. I've just been very deliberate and taking my time, even though the technology allows me and allows all of us to shoot endless amounts of images. It's, I, I still shoot in a very precise, simple way when I'm on assignment. Um, and and yeah, it's just a quite a radically different world that we're living in technology. I got thirty minutes. Okay. <laughs> um, did, did you get the hint? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know if there's any more questions. Um, um, let's have a look here. Um, does it help knowing that uh, the images you've captured, albeit awful, um, help in some way in opening people's eyes to the rest of the world and what's going on? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I still, you know, um, I still believe that, that, that we do somehow um, affect in various ways the, the, the viewers of our pictures. Um, you know, I'm fully aware that I'm, I'm sharing pretty powerful, um, if not slightly depressing pictures at the moment of the coronavirus. You know, I mean, I wish I had something more upbeat to show from what, what's around me here in Johannesburg, um, of which I did do a set of portraits of people at home, which, which showed the, that more personal side of things. But yeah, I think that, that journalism per se is, is a critical part of the democracy and of, of society. And I think it's our job to, to really go out there and just you know, show the public what's happening. That said, I know that it's very messy at, at the moment um, with social media um, and, and fake news. Um, so it is a very messy, murky, dark world of news. Um, and what I mean by that is just, I'll tell you an anecdote. So I've got daughters, they're 17, and, you know, like any 17-year-old, they live on their phones. But what I've tried to do is just say to them, okay, 
find one or two reliable, genuine news sources. Um, in this case, I, I put them onto the Guardian newspaper in the UK. A um, little bit left wing, but okay, that's fine. Um, and, you know, News 24 in South Africa. So um, it's, I think it's about, um, as a viewer, finding a good source of news that you can trust and staying with it. And I think that's really critical. So back to that question, yeah, I mean, we're a bona fide news source. And I think it's my job to, to go out there and try and just um, show the world what's happening. So I got a nice hint from Quentin to show some more pictures. So I'll go back to that one because I'm going to talk a little bit about the coronavirus and how we're covering it. Um, yeah, so I suppose some of you may recognize that bridge may have driven over it um, when there's a gazillion cars and pedestrians. Um, this is Mandela Bridge in downtown Joburg on day one of the lockdown. Um, so yeah, we, we you know, there, there's, there's a number of photographers who, who are out there working at the moment. We are, are allowed to work in the field, by the way, so just to tell you, um, to be able to work as, as, um, as a journalist now, um, in terms of the govern, government regulations, you have to have your bona fide up-to-date press card from your, from your organization. You've got to have um, filled out um, you know, a specific document from the government that they put out last week prior to the lockdown that's signed by the CEO of your company that you work for, blah, blah, blah. And um, you know, you've got to be wearing a mask and gloves at all time. So I just thought that would be interesting. You know, we are allowed to work wherever we want. Um, we, we have in the last, I've been working the last six days, five days out of the last six, we have been stopped by police um and by soldiers in 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 roadblocks to say look are you working are you media where's your paperwork so um you know the authorities are doing their job to make sure that you know we, we're doing our job as it were um i think the the one thing that's that's really very different about this story compared to any other story that i've covered is that this is very personal so it's it's affecting you know my family directly um, normally, even for stuff like the civil wars that I've covered or, um, you know, the Gulf War, of course, as a, as a journalist, you leave your house, you leave your family and you go to this often crazy place, you do your job and then you come home um, and, you know, you're back to your family. So there's like this disconnect between what you're covering and, and your family life. This is obviously, as you can imagine, extremely different. Um, you know, it's, it's about us as journalists going out to cover the story, um, taking the best precautions we can. I mean, I'm wearing, obviously wearing gloves, mask, um, you know, disinfecting all the time, cleaning my gear. And then when I come home, um, I'm disinfecting outside the house before I come in. I'm cleaning my gear before I come into the house. Um, so, you know, it's, we're taking, in general, um, every journalist I've seen working out there is taking the, the biggest um, precautions we can. But, you know, just anxiety-wise, I mean, my anxiety levels are, are pretty high, um, notwithstanding the sort of the yoga I do and the, and the other sort of self-care stuff that I practice all the time. Um, it's, it's very anxious. And I think the other strange thing is that, um, you know, for instance, covering you know, hard news, uh, a protest or a riot, you can actually visually see where the danger is. You can make those decisions on where you should stand or where you shouldn't stand or, you know, is it time to put on a long Zoom because I'm too close to the action just for safety reasons? Um, you know, those types of parameters don't exist anymore because this virus is unseen. So, you know, that's the one thing, you know, that's, that's and here you're looking at a picture of, the police in Hillbrow basically forcefully um, implementing the, the social distancing rule. Um, so yeah, it's it's proving to be a, a very different story to cover. Um, the slide I'm showing you now is the one part of the story so far, and it's only day six. It's really affected me, and that I wanted to 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 show the world as it were, is just you know the plight of the homeless people because. Um, you know, it was all very cool for the government and governments around the world, doesn't matter who it is, I'm not taking a shot at the government here, 
but you're know, locked down, you must all go and stay in your house. Well, that's cool if you've got a house or a flat or wherever you may live, but the homeless have got nowhere to go. So um, I spent the last couple of days um, putting together a photo story, which I put out today on Instagram and, and Facebook and went out on the agency last night on the plight of, of, of the homeless. Um, so I think that's another um, way that we're going to try and cover the story, because the other thing that we've all realized is that we don't know when the story is going to end. You know, normally, um, you know, I will go to, for instance, a sporting event, and I know exactly when it starts and ends, and so does my family. Um, you know, I know when I'm coming home. Um, even for stuff like my embed in Iraq, I knew it was for a month. I knew the dates that it would start and finish. Um, yet this coronavirus story for us as journalists from our perspective and for all of us as citizens, um, you know, we just don't know when it's going to end. I mean, we've got a alleged 21-day lockdown. It remains to be seen if, it, if, if, if it, it does get extended or not. But certainly for us as journalists, we in, I'm in the story for months to come. So, you know, that's another thing we're just trying to do is work out how to pace ourselves with the story and, and find a balance between putting ourselves on the, on the front line of the virus in, in, in harm's way and balanced with, okay, it's time to stay at home for two days or whatever it may be to, to try and recover. So yeah, I suppose that mentally recovering is, um, is quite important because uh, you, know, you can't just keep hitting it uh, day after day after day and, and giving it 100% because um, eventually you're going to fall over or you're going to make a mistake and, um, and that could have um, you know, some dire consequences. Yeah, I mean, like yesterday, I mean, I'm not, I'll be totally open with you guys. I mean, I got back um, around 12, 1 o'clock midday. Um, so that was like the fifth day of, of working pretty hard uh, on, on the lockdown. But it had been going already for two and a half weeks. Well, we're into two and a half weeks of coverage for me. So that's 16, 17 days nonstop. And um, I mean, I got home and uh, I was absolutely shattered. I mean, I just... I climbed onto the sofa in our living room and I, and I fell asleep for an hour. I mean, that's, that's when you, you're really tired. And the problem there that we discussed this morning with some colleagues um, was Joao Silva from New York Times and, and myself and, and Alon um, from, from the Times newspaper is that, you know, that's when your immune system starts to get um, re really knocked if, you, yeah, if you're working hard. And that's, of course, not going to do you much good with, with covering the virus. So, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 we, we, we're playing a bit of Russian roulette, I've got to be honest. Um, as much as we're taking, uh, you know, um, the, the best precautions we can, other than going out there in a hazmat suit, um, uh, you, you, you sort of, you're hoping in the, in the analogy of Russian roulette that you, you get the cylinder that doesn't have a bullet in it because you know, we, and we're all trying to find our way. I mean, I think this is another thing for all of us as, as, as human beings on the planet. Um, you know, there, is, there has been no pandemic that the media industry has covered, you know, in, in living memory. You know, the Spanish flu was turn of the century, but um, media-wise, there's no one still alive or no um, rules and regulations or guidelines that, that we can implement. So within the media industry ourselves, we're trying to find our own ways in general, and then per company on how to deal with this 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 um, pandemic, and um, you know some companies are are doing better than others, um, you know, um, and 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 I think that the main thing is that that it's our own health, which is actually the media practitioner, it's our own health that is the main thing. So you know we've also got to we've also got to teach the companies that we work for how to treat us. Um, and then again, you know, um, it's got nothing really to do with EPA. They've been amazing uh, for us so far. But I think, you know, if the time comes when, when, we, when we as journalists say, look, well, we've got to implement some form of system where maybe you work for a week and then you're a week off, well, then it must happen. Um, yeah, so um, just the slide you're looking at, I thought I'd show you some equipment. Um, that's a sort of a one of these Instagram type pictures of uh, my <laughs> equipment. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I use Canon. Um, on the left hand side that you can see the two 5Ds. Um, I still really love prime lenses, man. I hardly ever use a zoom lens. Um, 
part of that is sort of the old school mindset, but um, most importantly, you know, one, they, they incredible quality. I mean, it's for, from all the camera, man, camera manufacturers, you know, those prime lenses are just ridiculous quality. Secondly, they don't tend to break as much as zoom lenses. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, when you when you're tooling around in a car or you you know, you know in a news environment, it's pretty harsh at times. So I find they really robust. But the one thing I do love about them, and so I use basically a 40 mil, the pancake if you're a Canon user, um, a 28 millimeter, which is my widest, and then a 35. That's it. Um, and and another reason for that is that I find. If you use the wide zoom, so 1635, which is what a lot of people use for, for news, and, and you know, a lot of newspaper photographers get given the basic kit, which is two, two camera bodies, uh, 70 to 200, and a 1635. Um, that 1635 is, I've got 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> you know, honestly, I'll be as harsh to say that, um, you know, wide zoom killed photojournalism to some degree. So what do I mean by that? Well, once you start going to a focal length wider than 28 millimeters, um, people's heads start to distort, um, you know, horizons start to get really wacky. Um, and, and, and in general, people get lazy with them. So in other words, if they're standing at a certain place and they want to just include, say, for instance, a room in front of them where there's one subject in the room, they just zoom that thing to 16 mil and include the whole room. Um, so, you know, they make you pretty lazy. Um, so the slide you're looking at, there's my prime lenses. And then, yes, I do have a 70 to 200. And in this, this case, I use that when, when I'm on a hard news job and look, it's just too, too dangerous to be that close to people. Because of course, if you're using prime lenses like that, you're very close to your subject. Um, and then now, I mean, it's, uh, you've got that Canon HD camcorder. I mean, we now, also have to shoot video, which is a whole another debate. I mean, it's radical. We, 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 we generally, on every assignment, shoot stills and video, which is really super hard work, I must say. Um, and are you looking at a, 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 you know, a helmet and a flak jacket, <laughs> which is what I used to wear for safety. Now that Corona's come along, it's a whole different thing. It's like hand gel and a mask and, and gloves. So um, that's that. And then this is my sports gear. Um, Obviously, the, this is my news gear is 5Ds and these are 1DXs. Um, in this case, I do use zooms. And why do I use zooms for sport? Because, of course, it's a quite a different environment. And quite often, you, you, you know, you're told to be in a certain place on a rugby field or a soccer field or, you know, you can't move. So you need that zoom ability, obviously, for that reason. And then, you know, standard um, legendary 400 2.8. So that's sort of my sports gear. Um, the lens on the bottom left is really amazing. That's the 100 to 400, um, the new 100 to 400, which is just, I'm um, loving it more and more for its ability to, to, to do that sort of stuff I need for sports and its quality and its focal speeds, really amazing. So that's just a tiny little look at some of the gear I use. What's next? Okay, well, if you want to follow me and look at my stuff, there's my Insta spam handle. It's Kim yeah, Labrook. <laughs> and uh, I think there's a thank you. So yeah, um, you know that's uh, that's all I've got to really add to our 21 day lockdown today. Okay, so I've got some questions. Um, what do you like shooting personally outside of the job? Oh my goodness, that's a tough question. You know why? Because I've suddenly do you even I pick up your shoot. camera? I'm, well, I don't. I mean, it's yeah. ridiculous. Um, Absolutely. You know, it's it. Um, Long story short, a photo editor I've just got to know really pushed my buttons and he, he gave me one year to shoot and produce for him, not maybe for publication, but just for him as a friend, a personal project. And I mean, I haven't even started it yet. So I mean, I think the answer, and thanks for the great question, I, <laughs> I don't shoot enough personal stuff. And, and so it's maybe something I need to work on. Yeah, I think the, you know, often what happens is if, if, your, if your camera is your job, um, you know, when you, when you get home, you put it down and, and, you know, you, you don't really want to take it further. You, cause if you pick it up, then you know that you've got to process the stuff and you've got to, uh, uh, you know, it just it becomes a whole extra thing that, um, you know, that you need to do. So, I mean, I understand that completely. Um, yeah, I mean, it, 
Yeah. yeah. Carry, no, on? carry on, mate. Okay, so uh, the next uh, next question: um, How do you deal with the explosion of citizen journalism slash social media? Okay, great question. Obvious, um, you know, and, and I don't mean it in a demeaning way, but it's a really great and obvious question. Um, what I've seen is that is that the need for bona fide photographers and photojournalists is, is, has not diminished. I think that's the big point. Um, that, that, that there's so much imagery out there and so much fake news and so many, um, I don't know how to put it, um, fake moments that I personally, and maybe I'm, not, I'm trying to kid myself, but I mean, I do believe it wholeheartedly that I think that it's, it's starting to, 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 to be, come to a point where people are realizing that bona fide news and photojournalism images are becoming more important, and especially at a time like this coronavirus. I mean, it's quite radical to see the, the incredible images being shot. I mean, the stuff from Italy, go do yourself a favor. Maybe I'll post a link on the Facebook group. There is some unbelievable images. And I think the big thing there is that they're documents of history. And I think this is one thing I'm trying to remind myself of, is that in my tiny little way, that, I mean, we're living through history. This is a pandemic in 2020. So in years to come, people are going to look at my pictures, your pictures, um, and, and other, you know, bona fide photographers. And, and it's going to be this document for history. So um, I hope I'm not um, fooling myself, but I do think that our, our role is still very relevant. But I think it's up to the viewer to make sure that they only follow relevant people, news yeah. organizations and photographers, because Absolutely. that's the big challenge. Um, yeah. You know, I, I have a social media system where I follow very few people. I choose who they are and I stick to that. I try not to look at the big picture. Otherwise, it's just too much. All right. And then I've got another one here. Um, do you also have to produce reports of what you cover in addition to the images or is it just the images? Yeah, so it's not a, when, we, when you ask report, um, no, I'm, I, you know, um, on a photo essay, I need to write between 500 and 1,000 words which go with the pictures. Um, on photo sets, which are a little bit smaller, like stuff I posted today on, on, on the homeless, um, there's a gain of 500 words. So it's not like I will do a full story and words. Yeah. So when we say photo journalist, I'll, I'll, the photo journalist part, the journalist part is the, ability to tell the story with the picture so no we don't do you know a, a story it's uh, it's it's primarily vi visuals cool okay um well then yeah i think um i think that uh, kind of puts us uh, at the end of um of our hour um and um i want you to say first of all thank you so much um for, for taking the time oh. the images are fantastic as i as i knew that they would be um, and, and just for giving us an insight into, you know, what it takes to, you know, to be a photojournalist, you know, I, th I think that um, you ask every person who, um, who speaks to a photographer and says, oh, I wish I was a photographer, you know, shooting all the time, but, there, but, but yeah. you know, you're shooting for 10, 15% of the time. The rest is yeah. processing admin, marketing, chasing uh, new clients, chasing people that owe you money, etc. cetera. Um, it is really the like you said, the, the, the romantic side of it that, that people see. And I, I fell into that trap and I'm, I'm still in that trap uh, when, I, when it comes to, uh, you know, photojournalists. Um, but, um, yeah, so I really appreciate your, your time and your energy and, and your, your honesty you. with us. And it's, uh, it's fantastic. I absolutely love it. And I hope um, everyone else here got uh, as much out of it as I did. Um, and, um, yeah, well, I'll just make sure that or let's, let's see if, uh, if there's any further questions um, on, the, on the comments and um, you can answer them from there. Uh, thanks, man, Quentin. And just to, you know, to, to thank you for this initiative. I mean, to give me the space and photographers that have gone before me and after, I think it's just such a great initiative. And I mean, aren't we blessed to live in a, uh, in 2020 where we've got this ability to connect with each other, you know, over the interwebs and, uh, and to talk and share. So yeah, thanks a million and well done to you. And uh, just hope all of you stay safe. Man. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Kim. Really appreciate okay. it. Cheers, Ciao. buddy. Bye. Ciao.